I've got a mule, her name is Sal. Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker and a good old pal. Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal. We've hauled some barges in our day. Filled with lumber, coal, and hay. And every inch of the way we know. From Albany down to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, for we're coming to a town. And you'll always know your neighbor. You'll always know your pal. If you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. If you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. Hey everybody, welcome to this fireside chat on the market revolution and the Gilded Age. Just a reminder that this is uh, going to be informative at the very beginning and then we'll turn to a more question and answer session towards the end of it. So if you don't have anything to take notes with, I suggest you get it unless you have an impeccable ability to remember things, in which case go ahead and listen away and hopefully uh, you'll test your elephant-like memory. Okay, it's just a uh, little word on how I'm gonna set this up. We're gonna go by themes today, and we're gonna focus on the themes that are highlighted by the red boxes. You'll see that, um, you'll see that um, there are eight themes in the, in the class, and this might be something, either a slide or a part of the video that, that you take a screenshot of for your own record, because it's something that might come in handy. Uh, for you down the road. The College Board likes to ask questions in themes and usually if you've touched upon one theme, you're gonna uh, hit the nail on the head with regard to the entire uh, crux of the question. So they are beneficial to, to know. I wouldn't obsess over them, but that's at least how we're gonna uh, or organize this talk. So we'll go theme by theme and we'll talk about the market revolution and the Gilded Age in terms of each theme. Hopefully I'm done in about 20 to 30 minutes and then that, that'll leave us at least a half an hour for questions and answers. So just to uh, review over all these periods with you, um, the market revolution is a period in American history that is taking place mostly between 1820 and 1860. The seeds are sown before that, but for the most part, this is when the transformation or the revolution takes place. Uh, and we would define it as a major change in the way goods are produced, consumed, and distributed. The College Board, and this should be no uh, surprise to us considering that they are a liberal and progressive, quote, institution, they focus on the distribution, production, and uh, consumption of goods becoming easier during this time period. And while that can certainly be said for those at uh, the top of the social class hierarchy, I don't know that it necessarily got better for everyone. There's an epic book called The Reshaping of Everyday Lives. I forget the name of the author, but anyways, it talks about how regular people lived during this time period, and it was like hell on earth. Uh, you went to the bathroom in a chamber pot, and um, you kids were beaten by their parents all the time. Everyone was sick and or drunk nonstop. So really, uh, the nostalgia for this period is kind of uh, ill-informed. Anyways, that's what we have there for the first one, a major change in the way goods are produced, consumed, and distributed. The second uh, time period, the Gilded Age, which roughly between 1865 or the end of the Civil War and 1900, when people wisen up and start to question the uh, evolution of the American economy, is a period following the Civil War and is largely uh, because of the Civil War in which America's industrial capacity really uh, take, takes off. And as a result of that, you see uh, the American economy existing on a, on a level that it had not existed prior to that. Okay, so these, these are the two topics that we're going to tackle today. And uh, hopefully it brings back some memories from earlier in the year and answers any longstanding questions that you might have. Okay, so we're gonna start with the theme of work exchange and technology. And to be quite honest, this is the one that dominates both of the time periods. So it'll be the one that takes up the bulk of our time. So we'll start with the market re revolution. Let's talk about cha changes to production or energy. Well, hopefully you recall that at the beginning of the market revolution, most factories or production places were powered by water wheels or rivers. If you had to suffer through watching the epic 
half cartoon, half do documentary mill times when you were in Human Geo. You'll know this better than anybody else. But that gives way early in the period to the steam engine, which not only allows for factories to be placed off of a river, but also increases productive capacity of those factories. When that happens, what we get is the emergence of a new organization of uh, productive capacity and we get the factory system. So the factory system basically takes all of the steps in the production process that used to be done, say in a bunch of uh, different cottages, hence the name cottage industry, and puts it all under one roof. It's still a division of labor, but it's a division of labor that's more concentrated. It happens in one building as opposed to several houses throughout the countryside. This could not have been made possible without the, not really invention, but the um, acceleration of the use of interchangeable parts, which is of course done by none other than Eli Whitney, who we will come back to in a second. In addition to production, we also have improvements in transportation. So uh, best examples of these are the Erie Canal, which is of course a man-made river that connects the Hudson River with the Great Lakes. And that allows for people to more effectively transport things from New York City into the interior of the country and vice versa. Therefore, if I'm growing something in what was then the West states, modern day states like Indiana and Illinois, I now can utilize the market system, both for distribution of my goods and consumption of goods that I don't otherwise make. So it's basically forcing people to specialize in making one thing instead of being self-sufficient farmers. In addition to that, we have toll roads, the most famous of which was the National Road, which went from Vandalia, Illinois, uh, to Cumberland, West Virginia, what it is now, so about um, this length. It was dreadfully inefficient and took an insane amount of time and was bumpy as all get out. So it wasn't a comfortable ride, but it was something that connected the interior of the country. And where there are no rivers, that of course, uh, was useful. But then um, towards the middle and later part of the period, you see the onset of railroads. Now it's important to note because railroads are gonna come up in our discussion of the Gilded Age too, that this time period railroads were small, they were local, they tended to be run by local government entities, which means that they didn't always match, which means you could be on a railroad and it would go for a couple of miles and you have to stop and get off onto another car because the distance between the tracks or the gauge, they call it, was different. So uh, dread, dreadfully inconvenient, but we'll go ahead and fix that in the later period. The communication acceleration was seen through by the telegraph, which of course was invented in the 1840s by Samuel Morse. It of course becomes a big player in companies and factories being able to buy and sell products, you know, whether it be the raw materials that they need or the finished goods, it allows for a more efficient mar market system. And none of this could have taken place without the booming of agriculture, which happened because of inventions like the steel plow by John Deere, the mechanical reaper by Cyrus McCormick, and the cotton gin by Eli Whitney. Just a reminder that the, the cotton gin, actually, even though it makes cotton production and harvesting easier, actually leads to an increase in the amount of slaves being used because you need more slaves to pick the cotton. This, is, uh, this might help you, but if you're farming like that, it's very difficult. I know from experience. So why not, if a machine like that is invented and you have the capital to buy it, go ahead and take, take advantage. Believe me, this, not as good as that. Okay, so onto the Guild, Gilded Age where production and energy improvements are based mostly on the use of fossil fuels like petroleum. This of course is where John Rockefeller made all of his money. And whereas Americans were using whale oil before this, petroleum, and other fossil fuels uh, tend to be a lot easier. Now, even though America had already been mastering the steam engine, the steam engine during this time period becomes that much more efficient because it's gonna use coal in a uh, much higher rates. So you can see that uh, on this, this chart here, in 1850, most of the steam engines were being powered by wood. And by 1900, most of the steam engines were being powered by coal. Coal burns a lot longer, it's much more efficient, but it's also much more disgusting, which we'll get to in a second. Now this leads to mass industrial production. So while we had mass pseudo mass production or quasi mass production during the market revolution, it's on a whole nother level during the Gilded Age because the production mechanisms are that much more efficient. You can have a much bigger factory, moving at a much faster speed, making a lot more stuff. 
okay, which will then have to be sold to people, but we'll get to that in a second. One of the uh, best examples of this is the Bessemer process, which was a process by which impurities were blown out of steel, which allows for steel to not only be made more efficiently, but also a better grade of steel being made, which means if you have stronger steel, you can have bigger railroads and you can put more stuff on the rail cars, which we'll get to in a second. Now, this mass industrial production, which leads to massive factories, is going to lead to the de-skilling of labor. So while as division of labor started during the market revolution, it's going to be on steroids here during the Gilded Age. And we also see the advent of the modern corporation, a heavily bureaucratic organization with uh, clerks and secretaries and middle managers and laborers and the whole kit and caboodle. It's much more complicated of an organization than the Lowell factory system had. Now, Various corporations took different avenues by which to exert their influence and expand their power in the corporate world. Horizontal and vertical integrations were the two main. Horizontal integration is when you buy up all the other businesses that are making the same commodity as you. So I'm John Rockefeller and I'm going to buy all the other oil companies. Or vertical integration, which buys all those involved in making a certain product. So I'm Philip Armour or Gustavus Swift. I'm making meat. I'm gonna buy the ice maker, I'm gonna buy the refrigerator rail cars, I might even buy a, uh, an aspect or a portion of the railroads, I'm gonna buy the butcher, I'm gonna buy the, uh, perhaps even where the cattle are great, uh, where, where, where they graze or where they're raised, anything like that. So I'm gonna buy every aspect of the production process. Tran transportation during this time period was uh, spearheaded by uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt on the East Coast and Leland Stanford on the West Coast, hence the, uh, hence the reason their namesake for such wonderful academic institutions. Uh, but they help see through and uh, build the Transcontinental Railroad, which of course allows for things to be shipped more efficiently from east to west and vice versa. That allows for American products, which remember we're making a lot of them now, so we got to sell them some, somewhere to be sold over in Asian markets who desperately wanted American-made goods. In addition, we also have more powerful steam-powered ships and more powerful steam-powered rail, which allows for us to just sell that much more. In the realm of communication, the telephone is the, the new thing on the scene, which of course allows for a, a more easy voice transmission than uh, the how telegraph dots and dashes. But uh, the telegraph is still the dominant aspect. It won't be till the uh, early to mid 1900s that telephones are more widely used by Americans. But one thing, one uh, a bit of pro progress in terms of the telegraph is that they lay something called the transatlantic cable which is a cable that goes from New York to London, so you can now connect American with European markets. In the realm of agriculture, more effective farm machinery that's now being powered by these more effective engines means that people don't need to work on the farms as much because we don't need as much labor there. And so they're gonna now take place or take part in the uh, budding industrial economy. Okay, so that's work exchange and technology. So now let's move on to geography and the environment. So. I sort of uh, was at a loss for how to split this up, but uh, we'll do it like this. Just, we'll just talk about the geographic regions and then the impact on the environment of the era. So during the market revolution, the North had most of the textile mills. They're built along rivers. They utilize the current and or small man-made canals. Um, the steam engine comes along, but the factories still stay in the North uh, because that's where the most densely populated areas of consumers are. The South, of course, which is ideal for growing cotton and other cash crops, is going to do most of the growing of raw materials that will be utilized in this new mar market economy. The West is growing most of the food, and of course the West is opened up by agricultural inventions, and now it can support a growing population, mainly on that northeastern coast. The environmental impact of the market revolution is there, but it's neg negligible. So the canals certainly alter the landscape. The trains certainly alter the landscape with the, rail with the railroads being laid, but then also the locomotives uh, spew po pollutants into the air, uh, as do factories. But it's really, the market revolution's environmental impact is se uh, severely limited compared to one, England's Industrial Revolution, which was using coal from the get-go, and the Gilded Age, which hopefully uh, you can gather from the nice bit of smog in that picture. Okay, so during the Gilded Age, nothing changes in terms of densely pop populated 
cities in America. Most of them are in the north, and uh, the most iconic ones are on the east coast. But now, since transportation is much more efficient, you see bigger cities start to grow up in the Midwest, hence Chicago. Okay, so in these cities, there's very densely populated na neighborhoods, which means there's going to be a lot of human waste that is accum accumulated. And since American cities were uh, built quite fast and not often planned, uh, a lot of manipulation had to be done in order for humans to dispose of their waste. In the South, hopefully you recall that they underwent a minimal industrialization process dubbed the New South. It stays mostly agrarian, but it is industrializing. Still grows cotton, still grows tobacco, still grows rice, but a lot of textile factories actually begin to move from the North to the South. So we'll see the beginnings of deindustrialization in places like Massachusetts. In the West, they're still growing all of the food, although there's a bigger West open now, states like Kansas, Nebraska, um, and uh, places like that that weren't really growing a lot of food, you know, around 1840 are growing a ton of food now. And of course, these amber waves of grain are, grain are needed to support this growing population. The environmental impact of this era, as uh, hopefully you saw during our discussions in the 1970s was tr tremendous. The chemicals, the waste uh, stayed in, and in some cases is still there in uh, the land landscape. Slaughterhouses dumped a ton of animal waste into the environment. For example, there is uh, Ubbly Creek, which is that off branch of the Chicago River where the meatpacking plants were. They still have pockets of fat and animal byproducts that will detach from the bottom of the river, float to the top and burst and let off a foul smelling odor that people in their really nice houses on that branch of the Chicago River uh, can smell. Might bring home values down a little bit, but uh, I'm sure they're, they're still fine. But human pollution uh, in terms of the garbage that's amassed by these new massive uh, industrial centers is just catastrophic to the environment. So when we're talking about impact on the environment, this is really the age uh, that will do the most da damage to it. Okay, second most important, I would argue, of the things we're ta talking about to work exchange and technology is migration and settlement. So during the market revolution, you see a massive internal migration of people. I'm Okay, I shouldn't use the word massive, but it's large. People move from self-sufficient farms and more rural areas to these urbanizing factory centers. And the reason why I don't want to use the word massive is because it's very selective on who moves to these places. Um, movement westward does happen with the opening of new land because of agricultural innovation. This, of course, is, is uh, begun by the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, but then America just keeps moving uh, people into that area that was purchased from, from France. So, there is um, this continuous flow of Americans westward, but more importantly, the flow from self-sufficient farms to fac factory centers is going to allow for the market re revolution to continue. In terms of settlement, m the people who are migrating, like we said, are settling in these factory centers in urban areas like New York and Philadelphia, but they're also settling along new tra transportation routes. If you're using the Erie Canal or the Na National Road or the new railroads, there have to be some sort of settlements along the way for people to stop, resupply, and get the things that, that they need. Now, most important to migration and settlement, though, during both of these eras is immigration. So during this first time period, 1820 to 1860, most of the immigrants come from Germany or Ireland. But the diff there's a difference in the types of immigrants that are coming from those places. German immigrants tend to be uh, moderately comfortable financially. They're escaping political persecution and therefore they're able to bring material items with them. They settle mostly in the Midwest, around places where, where we live, because they have the financial capacity to get there. On the other hand, the Irish, who are of course escaping uh, a potato famine, kudos to all my Irish people in the audience, um, they are coming in order to escape death. And so, uh, they don't have the luxury of choosing where to, to settle when they get here. So most Irish people upon arriving in the United States will settle along the East Coast in New York. Now responses are predictable considering this is American history. Uh, there's anti-Catholic sentiment, kudos to all my Catholics out in the audience and Irish Catholics in the audience. Uh, they take on a lot of um, uh, negative attitudes from the Protestants that are already here. The 
best example of this is, of course, the fact that America has a political party that grows up during this time period, the Know Nothings, who is, are explicitly devoted to anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant sentiments. What a wonderful country that prides itself on having a political party like that. Good thing there's no political party like that anymore. Okay, moving on. The Gilded Age um, sees uh, migration on a larger scale than the market re revolution does. So because many farmers would have been kicked off of their land either because they lost it, couldn't pay for it, an economic panic did them in, or other externalities, uh, or they were um, sort of the industrial economy caught their eye and they wanted to move, so it, there was a pull factor, or they were simply replaced by technology. A lot of former rural dwellers will move into urban centers. More able black Americans, so better off sharecroppers, are going to move north during this time period. The Great Migration doesn't happen yet because the Great Migration encompasses a larger amount of Blacks that move north. However, the College Board in its curriculum outline wants you to recognize that many people moving into cities and industrial centers during this time are women off of farms and Black Americans who can afford it. So there is a substantial migration of Blacks preceding what we would consider the Great Migration between 1950 and 1970. Most of them are moving for job opportunities. That should be uh, no surprise to you. Where do they settle? Mostly in urban areas like New York and Chicago. They're living, if they're poor, primarily in tenement houses, but they're also choosing to live in ethnic enclaves. And hopefully your reading of The Jungle hammers this point home, but they wanted to settle with people similar to them. If you get a chance and you have it available, watch The Godfather Part Two. Excellent uh, explanation of Italian living in New York around this time period. Uh, so speaking of those Ital Italians and immigrants, most immigrants during this time period came from Southeastern Europe. They were escaping political unrest, fam famine, and poverty, but more so during this time, they're drawn by the allure that America has to offer. So if you remember back to the jungle, for instance, uh, Jurgis Yer and his family come to America because uh, Jonas hears that there's all these one, wonderful opportunities and everybody make, makes it big and rich. Now, this is not to go to uh, speak to the naivete of people from Southeastern Europe because there were companies, Henry Ford being uh, uh, chief among them, who would send out uh, executives or would send out ambassadors to the Ford company to actually go and recruit people to come to America to work for him. Why did they want the immigrants? Well, immigrants worked on the cheap. And so you could exploit them more easily than you could exploit people that spoke the language and had been here. Best example of this is that those, those Irish who settled during the market re revolution, who were here for a generation or two, by this time are the main move, movers and shakers politically, which just goes to show you that uh, it's easier to exploit a first generation immigrant than it is to exploit a third generation immigrant uh, because those Irish uh, that had been here for a while weren't getting um, exploited anymore. So make sure that you keep that in your repertoire in case anybody bad mouths the Irish. Okay, how did uh, people react to this new in increase of immigrants predominantly from Southeastern Europe where people are Catholic and or Asia where people are Asian? Well, they uh, organized American protective associations and of course pulled out the prevailing ideology of the day, social Darwinism. So the idea that some groups were just better off and better served to make it in this world. Uh, therefore, you get what you get, you don't throw a fit. All right, there were also anti-Catholic organizations though. This is best exemplified by the resurgence of the KKK in the 1920s. However, there were some do-gooder Americans that accommodated uh, the immigrants as they show, showed up, chief among them Jane Addams and her work in the Settlement House movement. Settlement houses, of course, were there to try and help uh, acclimate immigrants to their new surroundings. Okay, politics and power, what I would argue is the most confusing one of all of them, particularly with the Gilded Age, so hopefully your listening ears are on. During the market re revolution, it's so important to understand that one, the federal government is much more powerful in your life than it was back then. So if looking at the federal government and what it did through the lens of today is a mistake. But we cannot underscore the fact enough that the government aided in the industrialization process during the market re revolution. It chartered the second national bank, which of course was then destroyed by our, our hero, Andrew Jackson. It supported protective tariffs 
Uh, that, of course, led to the whole tariff of, of abominations and uh, nullification crisis that was, uh, occurred in the 1830s. And it oversaw strengthening of the federal role in the economy with Supreme Court cases like McCulloch versus Maryland in 1817, which uh, re-emphasized the supremacy clause or the federal government's ability to overrule states. Gibbons versus Ogden in 1824, uh, where they argued that interstate commerce was to be regulated by the federal government in the event that there was a discrepancy between two states. The federal government would be the final arbiter of that condition. And Dartmouth versus Woodward in 1819, which protected private contracts. Uh, so the government would protect those private contracts. So here we have the government stepping in and just going to show you that there's no such thing as a free market. Okay, in addition to the government helping industrialization, there's also regional conflict that is occurring in politics. You have Henry Clay's American system, which is um, supported by some, not by others. It tended to be supported by the people in the North and the West and uh, not supported by people in the South because it advocated for a bank and protective tariffs, which of course the South was not on board with. Uh, but then also slavery, which has increased and been ramp ramped up because of the new market economy, uh, was beginning to cause political conflict between uh, uh, various sections of the country, North and South, obviously. Um, the major parties during the time period were the De Democrats or the Planter and uh, Jad Jacksonian class. And then for the most part, for the most part of the time period, it was the Whigs or the merchants, factory owners, and all those that hated Andrew Jackson. Kind of a mixed bag there, but those are our major political parties. The Whigs, of course, will go away in 1848 because Andrew Jackson will have died and you can't really have a party based upon hating Andrew Jackson if Andrew Jackson is no longer alive. Okay, moving on to the Gilded Age. The government during the Gilded Age also aided in industrialization efforts. They passed high protective tariffs. They subsidized the railway. Hopefully you recall that the Pacific Railway Act, which was passed during the Civil War because the South couldn't vote on it, uh, basically got together the funds to build the Transcontinental Railroad. And then it, of course, just had a national government that catered to big business. Now, why did it cater to big business? Well, uh, the way government officials, pre predominantly in the Senate, were elected was by uh, the House of Representatives, which means if I can get a House of Rep in my pocket, then I can get him to vote for my senator who can be friendly to my business. Well, who's got money to pay for politicians? Big businesses do. And that's why you see such iconic images as the bosses of the Senate, like the one that's not here on the screen. Mostly the government was laissez-faire. It thought that if it stayed out of economic affairs, other than to support them happening, then the economy would work most efficiently. This is why you have uh, such a hard time naming Gilded Age presidents, because you don't know who they are because they weren't really doing anything. Government would mostly, uh, worked on a local level during this time period. Political machines ruled the day like Boss Tweed in New York or Johnny Powers in Chicago. Uh, and there was massive corruption at this uh, level. Of course, you'll hopefully remember Mike Scully from the jungle as he's the best example of political machines that we read about. Parties during the time period were the Republicans who of course tended to side with the corporations, Democrats, which were mostly in the South and uh, tended to side with political machines. But really this goes to show you better than anything I think in our course, that it's really a one party system because political machines and corporations were just in cahoots uh, in an effort to make each other the most money that, that they could. And they say China is a one party state. Anyways, a uh, third party to emerge during the time period was of course the renegade farmers with their pitchforks and other mechanisms, the angry, mad at corporations, mad at ba banks foreclosing upon their farms, and mad at the fact that um, the uh, value of money was constantly deflating. And that, of course, is bad for them because they, don't, they won't, don't have the currency to pay off all their bills or buy their tractors, which is bad because then they can't grow their food. This, of course, is memorialized by the Wizard of Oz. And if you were there for that day, well, no more needs to be said. And I think that, that and this uh, brings us to our last one, so, social structures. So in, during the market re revolution, the family and gender roles started to undergo a massive change because no longer were people living on self-sufficient farms. So we see, to emer or we see emerging this idea of separate spheres or that there was gonna be a separation in family life between work and home. 
because now you went to work, you didn't do all the work at home. So now when that occurs, you see the emergence of the so-called cult of domesticity or the idea that in a household where the man works and the mother stays home, the man does the working and the mother stays at home and does the domestic work, hence cult of domesticity. Now this of course was railed against in the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, but basically little could be done because this was the prevailing uh, hegemonic cultural idea of the day, that work and home were gonna be separate, the woman was gonna be in charge of the home, and the man was gonna be in charge of the work effort. Now this of course varied by social class. If the poorer you are, the more likely it is that uh, the woman is working. Daily life was now dictated by clocks, not the sun, and what you bought and sold was dictated by how much money you have, which of course was dictated by your wages. It wasn't just barter system any longer. It was a market economy, baby, and you better be on board or go die, die down by the river. In terms of social classes, there were a few elite businessmen like Francis Cabot Lowell and other entrepreneurs that made it big with their uh, either innovations or factories that did well. There's also a growth of a middle class, but it's not really that big because it only contains middle managers, and for that there were only as many middle managers as there were factories. However, there's a large growth of working class uh, that are doing all the la laboring in the farms. There's very, very few self-sufficient farmers uh, left anymore, particularly in the North. In the South, of course, it's a different story because they're behind the curve on everything. In terms of who's doing the work, uh, it tended to be girls who were no longer needed on the farm because of, of new implements. Uh, that move from self-sufficient farms to industrial centers. So this is where we get our famous Lowell girls. And of course, uh, ch child la labor was also common, especially among poor immigrants who were also uh, doing a lot of the work. There were few la labor unions, but they do get their start in the 1840s and 50s. Why do la labor unions crop up? Well, because, you know, working's unsafe. And if, unless you put your hair up, you might get caught in a machine. I'm just glad that the middle manager looks concerned though, because I'm pretty sure in real life he wouldn't have been. All right, on to the Gild Gilded Age. Family and, and gender roles sort of mirror this. They're still separate spheres. The cult of dom domesticity is reinforced by class. So if you're poor, the uh, woman of the house is working, but if you're wealthy, then women tended to work less, which is why some of them had all that time uh, to advocate for such bourgeois pleasantries as voting. Day-to-day day -day life was changed a little bit because it was inundated with advertisements because there was so much stuff being made. And of course, you don't make something in response to the demand of the people, contrary to what Economics 101 will tell you. You make something and then tell the people that they need it, which is why advertisements are all over the place then and now. Everything is, for the most part, bought and sold outside of the home. Wages are going to drive work, but wages also buy what you can uh, drive what you can buy and sell, which is why even though this time period sees growing leisure and a growing consumer culture, it really just depended on how much money you have. A lot of the times what would happen is poor working class people would be swindled by fancy advertisements and promises that they could pay it off over time, and it just got them into a bog down with debt. Social classes, of course, there were a few ro robber barons at the top who were advocating, you know, let's do nice things with our money, uh, best exemplified by Andrew Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth. Uh, there is a growing middle class because of an increasing corporate bureaucracy. So now corporations are so much bigger than they were during the market re revolution that you need more clerks, you need more secretaries, you need more bookkeepers. You need more middle managers to oversee the bookkeepers. And so the middle class uh, does grow. However, wealth inequality grows tremendously during this time period as the people doing the actual work, the laborers are making so little and the robber barons are making so much that even though there's a, quote, growing middle class, there really isn't anything done to the disparity in wealth. In fact, it's made worse during the time period. In terms of work, who's doing all, all of the, the work, it tends to be child labor still. Um, it's made illegal towards the end, but as we saw in the jungle, there were, were ways around that. Uh, and then immigrants from Southeastern Europe and Asia, and of course, poor women worked because they could be paid less as could kids. Because of all of the dangers associated with modern industrial work, 
uh, unions tend to grow, uh, grow increasingly in number, but then also increase in uh, their power. Best example of un unions, of course, are, are the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. Okay, so that's where we are at. So let me go ahead and check my chat. Um, Oh, more Morgan want, wanted me to slow slow down. Sorry, Morgan, I didn't see it until right now, but uh, I pr probably did not um, abide by that.